He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Amen. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you be destroyed in your way. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. In the turbulent days of the French Revolution, and there are people in our country and in our culture who are thinking that what they are doing in our culture and in our country parallels in very distinct ways what happened during the French Revolution. They believe themselves to be the inheritors of the spirit of the French Revolution, and they think that they are doing a good work in identifying themselves with that and acting out what was acted out in France uh, during those days of the French Revolution. But during those days of the French, French Revolution, a political revolutionary stormed the Bastille in France, seeking to remove every vestige of law and order from the eyes of his countrymen. He scaled to the top of the Cathedral of Notre Dame and tore down the cross from atop its spire. And as it fell, it of course hit the ground, and in doing so, it was dashed into pieces on the ground below. The cross, of course, represented the authority of God, and it lay demolished for everybody and everyone to see. And turning to a poor peasant, the revolter boasted, we're going to pull down all that reminds you of God. But from the crowd came a challenging reply in the form of these words. Citizen, then you might as well pull the stars down themselves. Well, you can pull a cross down, but you cannot pull the stars down, can you? Such is impossible. And so are the arrogant attempts of sinful men and sinful women to overthrow the sovereign rule of God. And yet this is what Psalm 2 portrays, the ongoing rebellion of a lost world against God and his son. You mean the son is mentioned in this text? Oh, yeah, it is. You hear three different voices four different times as we read the text. You first of all hear the voice of the narrator, and then you hear the voice of God the Father, and then you hear the voice of God the Son. Jesus said, verse 7, he said to me, you are my son, and today I have become your father. That's the voice of Jesus. And then to close things out, you have the voice once again of, of, of the narrator. So this is a messianic song. This is a psalm that perhaps had local and particular application to the present time, the present day, i.e. the coronation of a king, but the ultimate fulfillment of this particular psalm is realized in the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This psalm is about Jesus, and it's important that we recognize and understand that, that the ultimate fulfillment of this, really, and the ultimate fulfillment of all of Revelation is found ultimately in the person of Jesus Christ, but it's a picture, a portrait of the ongoing rebellion of a lost world against God and his son, Jesus. Notice in verses 2 and 3, the rebellion against our sure and settled sovereign. Is he really sure and is he really settled, immovable and unperturbable? And the answer is absolutely if we pay attention to what it is the Bible says. Verse 4, the Bible refers to God as the one enthroned in heaven. He is sure and he is settled. And so in verse 1 of chapter 2, or rather of Psalm 2, the psalmist asked the question, why do the nations rage? That's a descriptive word, isn't it? The word Rage. People sometimes fly into a rage when they're really hacked or really ticked. These people are really hacked and really ticked because they cannot stand the idea of God being so enthroned and so immovable and so unassailable. They rage. Violent demonstration, visceral demonstration of anger. That's what the word actually means. It's what it refers to. Why in the world? 
do the nations rage? And why the world with the peoples plot in vain? In other words, they're plotting and they're planning. It's meaningless. It's empty. It is pointless. It is to no avail. So the psalmist here is absolutely amazed that people would rebel against God in the attempt to bring God's down. If you were to press him and ask him, what do you think about it? The psalmist may have said, well, these people are engaged upon a fool's errand. Because it will come to absolutely nothing. They fight against him and they flail about, but to no avail. It's the Lord who purposes. It's the Lord who accomplishes. So says the Bible. So what they're doing is absolutely pointless and absolutely meaningless, and yet they still rebel. All of humanity is, is united in its rebellion against God's sovereign rule. Spurgeon put it like this. We have in these verses a clear description of the hatred of human nature against the Christ of God. Is that what we're really dealing with here? The hatred of humanity against, against God the Father and his son Jesus Jesus Christ. Some people have a problem with that and would object straight out and straight up and would say, well, humanity doesn't hate God, but that's not a reasonable nor is it a scriptural position. The Bible says otherwise. The Bible says quite clearly, for example, in Romans chapter 8, verse 7, that the natural carnal mind is at enmity against God. To be at enmity means to be actively opposed or hostile to someone. And the someone in this case is obviously the person and the being of God himself. The NIV puts it like this, the sinful mind is hostile to God. The mind set on the flesh in the ESV is hostile to God. So natural man who possesses a natural mind, and when we talk about a natural man, we're talking about a person who is in the flesh as opposed to in the spirit. When we're in the Spirit, we confess that Jesus is Lord. When we're in the Spirit, we receive him as our Savior. We follow him as our Lord when we are in the Spirit. And the Bible says that if we have not the Spirit, then we have not the Lord Jesus Christ. But what is a man left unto himself? He is a natural man. He is controlled by the flesh. And because he is, he's antagonistic toward God. And he's naturally antagonistic towards the things of God. This is what the Bible teaches us. We could say in common parlance, he's no big fan of God. And he naturally and he willfully opposes him. And the psalmist stands in utter and in absolute amazement. Now this rebellion, as we have seen in the text this rebellion is seen in the people. In verse 2, he refers to the kings of the earth and the rulers of the earth standing against the Lord and his anointed one, the anointed son. Well, in history, in days past, this has certainly been the case. You can look at the Bible and you'll see that, that the king Nimrod stood against the Lord and the Lord's purposes and the Lord's intentions. Pharaoh of Egypt most certainly did. Sennacherib, king of Assyria, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Antiochus Epiphanes, the Roman Caesars, etc. They all took their stand against the Lord and his anointed one. They have rebelled against him. But this text really doesn't confine itself to those rulers in history past. Our rulers today, and there are many rulers today, who oppose the Lord and his anointed one. You can just tick off the countries led by men and sometimes women who do, who have taken a stand against the Lord and who oppose him and consider themselves to be in no small way his adversary. You look at what's going on in communist China. With the leaders of communist China persecuting Christians and pulling down, literally pulling down and destroying unlicensed Churches, can you believe such a thing is going on in our world? It's just unfathomable to us, although there are folks running around setting fire to them, aren't there? It's happening everywhere, often, all the time. Why? Because 
of this animosity that exists in the human heart that unleashes itself in opposition to the Lord and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But this isn't just about the kings of the earth and the rulers of nations. This is about the peoples of the world. The peoples of the world, of every nation, of every tribe, of every tongue, of every people. They have fallen soon. So the revolt is not limited to these leaders. The human heart is engaged against rebellion, against God. That's why the Bible would say, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The ultimate sin is the denial of God. And yet this is what folks insist upon doing. You ask what a definition of sin is. The Bible very specifically defines sin as disobedience of disobedience against God. God, against his law, against his will, against his person, against his purposes, as clearly revealed to us in the Bible and in the word of God. He isn't valued. He isn't appreciated. He isn't wanted. There's no interest in enjoying him or relating to him or even seeking him without his aid and without his help. Why? We are steeped in sin. And because we are so profoundly steeped in sin as fallen persons, as fallen men. Amen. We prefer disobedience to obedience. And we prefer an adversarial relationship to a re relationship of reconciliation and devotion an absolute commitment. We see the people, the kings of the earth, and the rulers and the peoples of the earth have rebelled against him. Notice their posture. Verse 2 says they have taken their stand against the Lord. They are determined in their stand and in their effort to resist and to fight for or against the Lord. When we were in Alabama just a couple of weeks ago, one of my best friend's house, he's got four little grandchildren and I had the biggest, best time playing with those kids. And um, they're kind of wild like kids can be. And there's one that's really, they're all cute as can be. I mean, just cute as can be. And there's one little granddaughter about four years old who's a wild thing. I mean, just a wild thing. She is. And she just went wild with Uncle Rusty. I mean, she did. I went wild with her. And we got rough. And the rougher it gets, the rougher she gets, and the meaner she gets, she just something. So anyway, she had made a flying spread, arm spread, leg spread eagle dive onto me, and then she hops back and she assumes this posture, extends her hands and says, come at me, bro, come at me, bro, come at me, bro. She meant it, though. She really did. And it was so cute, and it was so cotton-picking funny. She took her stand, and she challenged me. Come on. Bring it on. Kind of like Lieutenant Dan on Forrest Gump. You remember the... I'm not the movie guy, okay? And this only comes to mind because... Our daughter was down for supper last night, and she loves Forrest Gump, and we were running through the channels, and it came on, and there it was. Doug's the movie guy. Bud's the movie guy. Those are the movie guys. Anything I quote, well, they don't get it. It's just far beyond them. It's so obscure and so old, it's just not even meaningful, so I just don't quote anything. And I'll, to quote so-and-so from a song back in the 70s, Bud knows, Bud's, Bud, but, but Doug has no clue. But anyway... <laughs> You remember the scene in Forrest Gump when Lieutenant Dan is up at the top of the mast riding out the storm. Remember Hurricane Camille or something like that that came through back in those doors? Well, they rode out the hurricane. The only shrimp boat to do so, and Lieutenant Dan's up there with the fist of defiance taking his stand against God. You think this has come some kind of storm? This is no storm. Just bring it on. Bring it on. Well, what is he doing? Is he talking to himself? Absolutely not. If you catch what he said earlier, he had a real problem. 
with belief and with trust in God because of all that had happened to him. And he took his stand. He was set against the person of God and held God responsible for all the bad stuff that had happened to him during the war. So there he is up there on the mast, shaking his fist of defiance in the face of God, saying basically, bring it on. Come at me, bro. I had a friend do that one time. I had just come to faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This would have been September of 1980. I've shared that story with you from time to time and don't want to bore you with all the details again, but the Lord got a hold of me then. And thankfully, he has kept hold of me. At, at times, I wonder why. I think sometimes it, he, he would be better off just to say, I'm done with this. This just ain't working. You just... But he doesn't do that, does he? So anyway, I'm living with a fellow. We have, we have a house. I'm an oil field worker. He runs his dad's ranch, and we just live it up, you know, with all of our friends uh, every night of the week practically and certainly every weekend. And uh, I got saved and didn't want to do that anymore. And so I felt like in my heart that I needed to share with him why well, I was the way I was, what had happened in my life. And so uh, we boiled some weenies one night, 25 cents a package at Safeway in those days, four for a dollar. And we boiled some weenies, and he put his mayonnaise and ketchup on his boiled weenie hot dog, nastiest thing on the planet. And, of course, I slathered mine in good old mustard. And we sat down and talked. I said, uh, you understand the changes that take place in my life? He said, yeah, you're no fun anymore. I said, well, there's something that has made a difference in my life, and uh, it can make a difference in yours too. Down at Jimmy's the other night, I told the Lord that I was sick of my sin and I wanted Christ to be my Savior. And you need to do that too. Because I've got something more important. I don't have to have that kind of fun. Because I've got Christ in my life. I've been forgiven of my sins. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. And he can be yours too. So let me ask you a couple of questions. If you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven? He said, I could care less whether or not I did. I said, well, let me follow that up with this. If you were to die tonight, and stand before God, and God were to say to you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? He said, the first thing I would do is double my fist up and stick it in his face. And you can imagine what he would have said from there. And I cannot share with you because of the language. It was just a bit too colorful. But what he did and what he said and what he did by virtue of his action was this. Out of hatred for God and enmity toward God, against God, I take my stand. And he basically said that night, come at me, bro. Come at me, bro. And this is the world in which we live. Men and women and lost folks everywhere have taken their stand against the Lord and his anointed one. And we hear it all the time in relationship to God. Come at me, bro. They disrespect him. They disregard him. They dismiss him. It happens all the time. And it's sad. Because the stand is against the Lord. I, I don't know what you think about him today. Maybe you've come in here with an opinion of the Lord. Of, of the God who created all that is. Of the God who is enthroned in, in heaven. Of the God who is said to be great. 
of the God who is said to be good. But this is the one against whom they have taken their stand. Not against Christian teaching, not against so much the church. All of that's meaningless unless that goes right back to him, right? What we're doing is meaningless unless he is at the dead center of it all, right? It makes no sense. There's no point in it if he doesn't exist. And you've got these people who say there is no God. He doesn't exist. Then why are you fighting an imaginary battle? Right? So many people on that side will say that. So many of these strident atheists today, and they're, they're everywhere, Richard Dawkins, etc. They're, they're everywhere. And my question is, I don't, I've not waged a campaign against looking around for really little ones. I'm not waging a war, a campaign against the tooth fairy. <laughs> the tooth fairy <laughs> death to the tooth fairy <laughs> string him up choke him out why because the tooth fairy doesn't exist <laughs> when I was a kid I believed the tooth fairy did exist but I believe the tooth fairy compared to my friends was really, really tight, cheap, and chinchy. Because <laughs> when my friends were getting quarters, and that was big money back then, big money back, you could do a lot with a quarter. You could go to the drugstore and you could get, you could get, uh, well, I'll tell you what you could get. You could get, uh, two, two Cokes of any flavor. Uh, in, in the Coke box there, they had, of course, Coke, and they had Dr. Pepper, and they had Sprite, and they had Grape, and they had Strawberry. And so that's, that's a Coke of five different flavors. But, you know, where I grew up, it was, everything was a Coke, but you'd get a Coke for a dime. And then you'd have money left over to buy bubble gum or a Jolly Rancher uh, stick. I sound like I'm old, but I'm really not that old. <laughs> Things have changed a lot in a very short period of time. But life, right, Carl? For a moment? I mean, yeah. <laughs> oh, you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Brother, I know, Kelly. <laughs> My buddies were getting quarters, and I was getting nickels and pennies. So maybe I do need. Maybe I do need to give leadership and impetus to a campaign against the tooth fairy because the tooth fairy wasn't so very great to me. But there are people with vehement, visceral hatred for God and the things of God. And they have taken a stand. And they have made it their life's objective to do everything they can to discredit somebody they say doesn't exist. That to me is insane and absolutely crazy because if he doesn't exist, then you're wasting, it seems like to me, a lot of good time and a lot of good effort. Amen. And yet that's where people are. They take their stand against one blessed. You read the Bible, and all you see on the pages of this Bible is one blessed, one beautiful. And he, he is beautiful. He's described as the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley. Roses are pretty, and so are lilies. And the word beautiful when you consider his holiness and his right, righteousness and his truthfulness, his blessedness, well, that would certainly apply to God, wouldn't it? 
He is the brilliant, the brilliant one in appearance as light, in terms of his all-knowingness. He is the benevolent one. He is the one that causes it to rain upon the just and the unjust. He is the one that provides, the Bible says, for every living thing. We rise of a day and we take breath. That is a gift from God. We have faculties of sight. We have faculties of hearing. We have faculties of touch. We have faculties of taste. We have emotions by which and through which we relate in person to other persons created by and to the image of God. The sad thing, the amazing thing, the thing that took the psalmist aback to a great degree was the fact that they had taken their stand against, against against the Lord, the Lord, the one good and great, the one mighty and merciful, the one high and holy, the one wise and wonderful. They have taken their stand against him. They're not just standing against him. They're speaking against him. Notice what they say in verse 3. Let us break their chains, the chains of the Father and the Son. Let us break their chains, they say, and let us throw off their fetters. They reveal their true opinion. And their opinion is this. The opinion of the fallen world and the people who comprise and constitute the fallen world. This is their opinion. And their opinion is they cannot be free. We cannot be free people until we are free of him. You've heard it before, haven't you? Whether you've heard it someone, someone speak it, or maybe you've heard it on a broadcast, or maybe you've read it in a book, Christianity. And faith in God and faith in Christ means that you lose freedom. That it's restrictive, that it's confining. And we don't want anything restrictive and confining, do we? I think maybe that's why I like summer so much, because I can most of the time, I guess I should dress like this most of the time. I really should. If, if I were, there was a day when I had to, if I, and if I were a preacher worth my salt, I'd, I'd probably dress like this or maybe in a tie every, every day. I, well, when I was a young preacher boy, I really looked forward to the day when I could, you know, dress up every day, look the part of the preacher. And, and we went to Dillard's first full-time church. We went to Dillard's out there in Lubbock one night, and I bought probably about a half dozen pair of, of Sands Belt slacks and, uh, you know, shirts and everything. I had my preacher gear, my, my preacher kit, my preacher clothes. And, man, I felt like I, you know, something else. And then after a while and years of wearing, I didn't own a pair of blue jeans for years and years. And after a while, I thought, man, this it's just kind of uncomfortable all the time, all the time. Just uncomfortable, restrictive, confining. So when I came to the point that I could turn those in for a golf shirt and some shorts and, and, and could do so without losing my salvation <laughs> or, or, or my call, do you ain't nothing special. Get rid of the clothes and quit trying to act like you are. Just be one of the gang. And I'm happiest when I'm in a pair of old khaki shorts, a cut-off T-shirt, and a camouflage cap and Dollar General. I, I just, that's me right there. Because <laughs> those other things are kind of confining and restrictive. Because when I get home, I can promise you, even though this is kind of comfortable, I'm, I'm getting it off. I'm not going to sit around all afternoon in khakis, in, in saddle oxfords, and a starched shirt. I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to do that. And a lot of people are saying, I'm not putting on what he's wanting me to wear. What God's wanting me to wear. If you're a Christian, you're wearing something. Did you know that? You, you, you know what you're wearing? You know, the wonderful thing is when we come to Christ, he takes off the old, soiled, nasty, dirty stuff. He takes and removes from us the old garments. And he clothes us in the righteousness of Christ. 
the divine one. You see, when we come to Christ, our sins aren't just forgiven and washed away. They are, but he, he, he gives us a new set of clothing in which we find ourselves to be clothed. And that clothing fits us for heaven and for glory. But the world says, I don't like that suit of clothes. I don't want to be clothed in that suit of clothes. They'll bind me up. They'll be restricted. They will be confining. They will be uncomfortable. I hated to dress up when I was a kid. It was awful. I remember my, my mom's dad came by one day. He wore a suit every day of his life. And he just thought I dressed like a heathen. You know, you just, you just dress like a heathen. So he came by one Saturday afternoon while I was at my aunt's house in Tyler. He said, we're going to join a fry, which was the exclusive men's store there in Tyler in those days. And so I said, what are we going to join a fry for, Dandy? You've got all the suits you need. You don't need another suit. So I'm not going to buy another suit. I'm going to buy you one. And I thought, what? Don't worry. You won't have to wear a tie with it. It's going to be a leisure suit. <laughs> That didn't make it any better. I didn't want anything to do with anything that involved a suit, okay? So off we went, and sure enough, we got it. And I'm going to tell you what, that was one of the, I, I, I love my little old dandy, but I'm going to tell you something, that was one of the worst experiences in my life. <laughs> Number one, to be fitted for it. And it was a white and salmon check. Leisure suit with a salmon colored shirt. <laughs> And I'm thinking in my mind, I just pray. I just pray against, I, I, that my friends do not find out about this. It, it, it will not be good. I'll never live this one down. Being fitted was bad enough, and then to think that I was going to have to wear it at some point was even worse. I hated that suit. It's awful. The world looks at that suit. Secured by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, his perfect obedience to the Father and the Father's will, the world looks at that suit. And the world then says, what I've got on is just fine. I don't need that suit. I don't need righteousness. I don't need holiness. There's nothing wrong with me. I don't know what your problem is, but I want no part of you. And the world takes its stand against the Lord yeah. and his anointed. <clears throat> and his anointed one. We don't want him to control us. We don't want him to have charge. Like Invictus, I am the captain of my ship, and I need no input from any other. God, I need no input from you. That troubles us, doesn't it? Because that's reality. You look at the television, you look on the internet, you read, if any of you get one, the newspaper, And you ask, why? If you want an answer to the question, this is why. It explains all that we need to know about it. And we look at this and we give thought and consideration to it. And in our spirits, we are greatly and profoundly troubled, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. We're troubled. I don't know about you, but I'm troubled by those things. By these who have taken their stand against the Lord. Out of their sinfulness comes rebellion and rejection and that troubles me. We can do two things about it. We can pray really hard and we should because it's only the power of God that can overcome such a recalcitrant, such an entrenched position and opinion. Only God can overcome that. So we have to pray and we have to petition God. And you know what else we need to do? We have to confront such things, such thinking with the power of the gospel. 
the power of the gospel, the word of God is as sharp as any two-edged sword. And it's able to plunge, it's able to pierce, it's able to divide, it's able to discern. And where you cannot touch the heart and the conscience, the word of God applied by the spirit of God to the mind and heart of man can. So from our position, this isn't really a hopeless sort of thing. Because God is saving all the time and every day. People from every nation, tribe, and tongue who are set against the Lord, who've taken their stand against him. He can bring them down. They cannot bring him down in rebellion against him. But you know what? He can bring them down. Those Roman Caesars who established a mighty and great empire, and even after the rule of Constantine, one of them said, guess what we have done? We have eradicated at best, and we have domesticated at worst this thing called Christianity. We have triumphed over it. It stands no longer. That was a pipe dream. Because even then, as he made those mighty pronouncements, Christianity was still very much alive and on the ascent. Oh, yeah. Christ remains. But what about those Roman Caesars? Where are they? They are dead in the dust. That's where they are. He can pull them down. And he can also save to the uttermost if he so desires. So, our being troubled compels us to pray and to proclaim. But is God troubled? Does he tune in to CNN or MSNBC or Fox News or OAN or whatever it might be? Does he pick up the New York Times of a morning and read the New York Times or listen to these broadcasts and say, oh my, I'm in trouble. There are a whole mess of people down here don't like me. They don't know where the suit of clothes that I'm willing to provide by faith in Jesus Christ. They don't like me. What am I going to do about this? Does he perceive their rebellion as a real threat? To him and to his kingdom. He doesn't perceive it any more than I perceived Mally Gray. That's her name. Mally Gray, who at four years old said to me, Come at me, bro. I should have yanked her up and busted her little fannies when I should have done it. Jesus, I'll show you, come at me, bro. God's no more bothered by. By that, than I was Melly Gray saying, come at me, bro. <coughs> Why? Because he is a sure and settled sovereign. And if you know him through Christ, he is your father. And Jesus Christ, the anointed one, is your blessed and elder brother. And if that's the case, then you know what? There's no need for you to be troubled either. By all the goings on in the world. What did Jesus say? In this world you shall have tribulation, trouble. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Our sure and settled sovereign is just that. And I pray that we would take him and trust in him in spite of what's going on in our world, that we would take him and trust in him today. May we pray. It may be that there are folks in this place today who have been accurately described by the Bible as the rebellious and the adversarial. 
your heart is set against the Lord. And you've had no interest in having anything to do with him or his son, Jesus Christ. You've rejected him. You've rebelled against him. And the reason, your heart is at enmity against God. But he's willing to receive you and he will take you close and bring you near as a true friend. He will forgive you all of your sins and become your father and bless your life with purpose and meaning. He will clothe you in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the divine one. If you will but say, all right, Lord, I'm going to admit it. I admit it. I'm a rebellious sinner. And I needed my life a redeeming Savior. And that Savior who redeems is Jesus Christ. He lived a perfect life. He bore your sins on the cross. He was raised from the dead that you might live and that you might have life. And if that's your need today, if the Spirit of the Lord is so working in your heart and your life, bringing you to that place to where you would gladly and willingly confess Him as your Savior, then you, by all means, today, Today, the Bible says, is the day of salvation. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe some of us this morning need to recommit ourselves to the notion and to the idea of the fact that he is a sure and settled sovereign and also all things under control and well in hand. And we need that reality to lift and to inspire our hearts and our lives today that we might live confidently this world that God has called us to impact and to have influence in. Maybe there are other decisions that others would like to make, maybe to join the church today, or maybe to rededicate a life, whatever it is. Myself and other members of the staff will be available after the service to help you in any way that we can. If you're online via Facebook Live and would like counsel today, you can call the church. We'll be here for a little while. We'll be happy to help you. Just respond. Respond to the leading of the Holy Spirit, the directing of the Holy Spirit, and do what it is the Lord would have you do this morning. Father in heaven, we bless you and thank you. And we praise you for being a sure and settled sovereign. We thank you that we who are, are indeed your people. And we are glad that we can declare and we are grateful that we can say that God is our Father and Jesus Christ, your Son, is our Savior and our elder brother. And that all of our needs, whatever they might be, are met fully, completely, and absolutely in Him. We love Him, and we love you, and we bless you, Lord, for all that you make available to us in grace and in mercy through the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you bless all of the folks gathered in this place today. I pray that, Lord, you keep us well and healthy. And I pray that you help us to live boldly as we live as lights and as salt for Jesus Christ in this fallen, decadent world. We pray in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I want to thank you all for coming and for being present here today. It's a pretty doggone good crowd for at the end of July and amidst the uh, COVID-19 spike. You're here today, and I thank you so very much for coming. If uh, you would like to contribute your offering, we're not going to pass the plate this morning. There will be a couple of offering plates um, out in the foyer, and as you leave today, you can drop your offering in there if you like. You can mail it. We appreciate the fact, though, you've been faithful to that. And uh, that's the incredible thing through all of this is that the giving has been astounding and amazing. And I thank the Lord for his generosity and you for your obedience. So thank you all for coming today. May the Lord bless each and every one of you. We're going to stand and we are going to dismiss with a song. So thank you for coming. And as soon as we're done singing it, you can go. Thank you for coming again. The Lord bless you each and every one.